because a cartoon ends doesn't mean that it's really over. Why? Especially for one as beloved as Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. From 2004 to 2009, we were transported to a world where any person or thing that has ever been thought of becomes real. Oh boy, this is gonna be good! It made us laugh and cry, which is why Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends still has a massive following to this day. But do you know what separates the casual Foster's fan from the devoted diehard? Knowledge. I'm Maggie at Fred Raider, and we're asking, do you think that you know everything there is to know about Mac, Blue, and the rest of the gang? Well, think again. There's so much more to this beloved series than meets the imaginary eye. So sit back, grab some snacks, because Channel Fred Raider is counting down the 107 facts you should know about Foster's home for imaginary friends. Number 1. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends was created by Craig McCracken, who also created the Powerpuff Girls. Number 2. Foster's first premiered on Cartoon Network on August 13, 2004 with a 90-minute TV movie called House of Blue. That's pretty handy to have 90 minutes to introduce all your characters instead of the usual 20. Number 3. Lauren Faust, one of the series' co-creators, was a writer on the Powerpuff Girls. She's also married to Craig McCracken and was a major player in helping to build the show from the ground up. Number 4. McCracken got the idea for the show when he and Faust adopted a pair of Labradors from an animal shelter. Aww. They kept wondering what the dogs' lives were like before they were adopted them and how it came to be they were in the shelter and McCracken got carried away with the idea. Number 5. Subsequently, a lot of friends on Fosters are based off of dog archetypes. Wilt is a three-legged dog who's injured but, you know, good-natured. Eduardo is a sweet but neurotic guard dog. Coco is the untrained dog that no one pays attention to, just like my poor Fluffy. Duchess is the pedigree dog with papers. Blue is a straight-up man's best friend. So, at its heart, Fosters is just a show about weird dogs. Number 6. McCracken was already searching for an excuse to do a new show. He was itching to create a fresh universe with some new characters especially since the only characters he'd been creating were bad guys that would inevitably just get beat up. Number 7. McCracken also started to become disillusioned with the number of aggressive us versus them shows on the air at the moment and the crime villain save the day agenda of the Powerpuff Girls. He points to Spongebob in particular as a show that made him want to work on something that was just a comedy series about funny characters. Number 8. McCracken's intent for Fosters was to create a fun, character-driven show that the whole family could enjoy, citing the Muppet Show as a primary inspiration from his childhood. A lot of the imaginary friends definitely looked like they could be Muppets. Number 9. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends was conceived visually at first. All of the friends started out as doodles. McCracken deliberately tried to create a wide variety of designs that looked good on screen and figured out the personalities from there. Number 10. McCracken did a kind of mix and match process when figuring out which personalities would work well in the show. Once he had an idea for a character, he would test them out against other characters to figure out which ones would get the most mileage of conflict and storytelling. This means a lot of initial characters were dumped for being redundant or straight up useless. You know, maybe there's a home for imaginary, imaginary friends. Inception! Number 11. Blue was the first specific character created for the show. He started out as a transparent, nebulous shape that became more solid and steadily shorter. McCracken said that it was as if the character was literally coming into focus the more he thought about him. Number 12. Blue is voiced by Keith Ferguson, who has bit parts in every show you probably like. You don't believe me? His credits include Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, Robot Chicken, The Lego Movie, Inside Out, Monsters University. Uh, yeah. I think I can you. Number 13. Keith Ferguson occasionally does voice matching for Owen Wilson. Wow. When he was auditioning for Blue, McCracken and the other directors asked for that impression and directed the voice from there. The directors were legitimately concerned that they wouldn't be able to find a voice that could be both lovable and a uh, kind of jerk. But an Owen Wilson type seemed to be perfect since he does kind of play lovable bad guys. Number 14. McCracken described Mac and Blue like the ego and the id, where the two really need each other. Mac is aware of his place in the world and his actions have consequences. And Blue is primal and raw. If Blue didn't have Mac, he would probably destroy the world. And if Mac didn't have Blue, he would probably never come out of his shell. Number 15. McCracken says that he was a lot like Blue as a child. The showman and the center of attention. However, he now claims to be more like Mac. Quiet, shy, and sensitive. Number 16. Mac has a brother named Terrence who's the archetypal bully older brother. As an archetypical bully, uh, his primary role is to make everybody's lives miserable. And boy, does he succeed.
Number 17. You never see the face of Mac and Terrence's mother. She also doesn't have a name. Really, the only things we know about her is that she works at a bank and used to have an imaginary friend. But considering that this is a show about imaginary friends made by children, it makes sense to have a Peanuts-like relationship with the uh, parent figures. Number 18. Their father is never shown or even mentioned in the entire series, leaving many to wonder if their parents are divorced or if the father passed away. Again, kinda dark for a kid's show, ain't it? Number 19. Mac isn't the only character on Foster's missing a parent. Both the Frankies have been gone since she was a child, and she's lived with the Fosters ever since. Fans speculate that both her parents probably passed away, because the few times that she does mention them, she does so really fondly, as in who let the dogs in and the trouble with scribbles. Number 20. Foster's was founded by Madden Foster and is run by Mr. Harriman, who is the acting president, and Frankie. Mr. Harriman is Mrs. Foster's imaginary friend from when she was a kid, so they've known each other for a long, long, long time. Just like me and my imaginary friend Sparky's. What? I didn't say that. Huh, never mind. Number 21. Madden Foster and Mr. Harriman are opposites in a very similar way to Mac and Blue. While Mr. Harriman is strict and uptight, Madden Foster is something of a free spirit. Hopefully this precedent means that Mac and Blue will also have a lifelong friendship. At least, you know, we'd all like to think so. Ha. <sighs> Number 22. Mr. Harriman is loosely based on Dr. Abner Perry from the 1973 sci-fi film At the Earth's Core. The character is a Victorian scientist who uses a giant drill and ends up in an underground labyrinth ruled by telepathic birds. Well, I guess strict rule abiding must come in handy while fighting telepathic birds, I guess? Number 23. Madame Foster's car is a Pontiac Trans Am from the late 1970s. What can we say? The ladies got style. Number 24. Blue's full name is Blue Regard. Q Kazoo. Other acceptable nicknames, of course, include L, Blue Dorino, Bluey, and Blue Dude. Just don't make Terrence's mistake and call him Bluefist. Number 25. Blue has an alter ego named Orlando Blue, which is him wearing a top hat, fake mustache, and a trench coat while standing on top of any number of imaginary friends. Is anyone else reminded of Vincent Alterman <laughs> from Bojack? I work at the business factory. I love that show. Number 26. Eduardo is voiced by Tom Kenny, who has roles in pretty much every other show you probably like. Number 27. McCracken was originally envisioning the voice for Eduardo to be smooth and similar to that of, say, uh, Ricardo Malterbon. Tom Kenny was encouraged to audition at the last moment as a joke and was really embarrassed over his audition. Luckily for us, McCracken loved what he described as Kenny's Spanish cookie monster impression. Number 28. When Eduardo was created, and McCracken knew that the creator was a kid living in a dangerous neighborhood and in need of protection. It wasn't until beginning to write Good Will's Hunting that McCracken and the other writers conceived of Nina Veltzeroso and decided that she should be a police officer. McCracken said it seemed natural. Number 29. Foster's was the first Cartoon Network show that made it into Micromedia Flash. This enabled a smaller staff to do an entire show in-house, which is really uncommon for an animated show. Number 30. Technically, the process to animate Foster's was a 2 2D slash digital hybrid. Everything started out hand drawn, and the characters in the backgrounds were cleaned up on a program called Illustrator, and then everything was taken into Flash to be animated. Foster's was the first show ever to use this hybrid process. Yay, innovation! Number 31. One major advantage to the Flash process is that the animators were able to build up a library of material that they could reuse in future episodes. For example, they created a walk cycle for a character, and they never had to animate it again. In other words, the more episodes they made, the larger the library grew, and the quicker they were able to animate an episode, which was nothing but good news for the fans. Unlike Star Wars, where we had to wait, I don't know, uh, like 10 years? Number 32. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends won five Emmys, all for outstanding individual achievement in animation. In case you need further proof that the animation in the show looks amazing. Number 33. Rob Renzetti came to direct on Foster's just as his own show, My Life as a Teenage Robot, was coming to an end. He's presently a director on Gravity Falls, and we talk about him on 107 Facts, too, so you should probably watch it. My Life as a Teenage Robot was one of my favorite shows growing up, BT dubs. Number 34. Frankie wears a t shirt with the Powerpuff Girls on it. She also owns a Blossom costume. You know, she probably gets a discount on all Powerpuff related items. Now I come to think about it. 
Number 35. Frankie is based on McCracken's wife and co-creator Lauren Faust. McCracken describes the character as a strong, independent woman who believes in doing the right thing. She hates having to do all the grunt work, but she believes so strongly in the cause that she perseveres. Number 36. Frankie's role in the show is to be a role model slash big sister to all the kids, as well as a contrast and connection to normal daily life, which is pretty important because a show like this could get off the ground pretty quickly without a character like Frankie. Number 37. Max Bowling's older brother Terrence is voiced by Tara Strong, and we're going to tell you all the major characters she's played in order of believability. Timmy Turner from The Fairly Odd Parents, Dill Pickles from Rugrats, and yeah, wait for it, Bubbles from Powerpuff Girls. You heard it right. Terrence is also sweet, squirrel-talking Bubbles. Kid you not. Number 38. McCracken said that the concepts for the voices for all the characters existed from their inception, so when he was auditioning voice actors, he had a pretty specific concept in mind. He wanted people that were not just funny, but could also embody the character, so a lot of people he worked with on Powerpuff Girls got the job. Number 39. The root of every story in Foster's is the character's personalities. <laughs> McCracken and the writers try to find relatable situations and allow the characters to just live in it. Their personalities dictate the actions from there on out. Or maybe slightly less relatable situations like what would happen if Blue stole a bus? But it's the route that counts. Although I have stolen a bus, so uh, I get it, Blue. Number 40. The Foster's crew are apparently big Homestar Runner fans because there are cameos galore. From a Blue's brother that looks suspiciously like Homestar to a Trogdor like friend wandering around the house. Number 41. Frankie is voiced by Gray Delisle, who also voices the evil babysitter Vicky from The Fairly Odd Parents. Well, they're both tall with orange hair. Oh my god, guys, are they cousins? Number 42. Frankie's real name is Frances. She dislikes Mr. Harriman calling her by her full name, though. Well, Miss Frances? Possibly because the female version of Frances is spelled with an E, so she technically carries the male version of the name. Number 43. Coco's evolution during her character design is surprisingly minimal, but the early sketches show her as a kind of terrifying pale slug. Number 44. Coco has the rather, uh, useful ability to lay giant plastic eggs with mysterious prizes inside. On occasion, she's even shown that she can control what prizes go inside the eggs. She also has the Yoshi-like ability to swallow something and have it reappear inside an egg. Number 45. Coco's eggs are based on the Kasafan toy machines that became popular in Japan in the early 2000s. You crank the machine and get a random toy in inside a egg-like capsule. Fortunately, you don't need to twist Coco's beak or anything to get an egg from her. Number 46. Coco never says anything other than Coco throughout the entire series. <laughs> Number 47. No one knows who Coco's creator is, but the writers were very adamant about keeping it secret to give her a air of mystery. Number 48. We do know that Coco was founded by two scientists, Douglas and Adam. The writers immediately knew that they wanted the two scientists to be Dexter and Mandark grown up, and you can really, really see the resemblance. Number 49. One very good reason that one of Coco's discoverers would resemble Dexter is that Candy Milo, Coco's voiceover actress, also supplied the voice of Dexter. Number 50. Dexter has made more than one cameo in Foster's, showing off an extremosaur to Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Presumably for jawbreakers, of course. Number 51. Crossovers happened in an even more major capacity in the Cartoon Network universe building comic and web game Fusion Fall. In the series, many characters from Cartoon Network shows, including Foster's, Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls, and Codename Kids Next Door, were reimagined as anime style characters who have to team up to save the world. Mac and Blue were two of the first characters to appear in the series. Where can I get my hands on that? Number 52. In 2006, Foster's had its own float in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and it gets even better because they sang a version of the Beatles with a little help from my friends. Number 53. Phil Lamar, the voice of Wilt, is perhaps better known as the voice of Hermes Conrad from Futurama. My manwich. He's also in Pulp Fiction as Marvin. Man, I don't even have an opinion. Number 54. Wilt is 10 feet tall and weighs 130 pounds. Now you can fully understand why Mac and Blue were so speechless when they first met him. Number 55. Wilt is named after the basketball player Player Wilt Chamberlain. His creator, Jordan Michaels, is an obvious play on Michael Jordan. They play basketball. Get it, guys? Number 56. Jordan Michaels created Wilt to help him get better at basketball. Wilt lost his arm and crooked his eye during a fateful basketball game where he saved little Jordan's life from being crushed by the monstrous foul Larry. Number 57. 
Wilt's initial character design shows that McCracken entertained a vision of Wilt with two arms and one leg for quite a while. One version even has Wilt with only one eye, even though he's beat up, I guess it could have been way worse for him. Number 58, Good Wilt Hunting was a one hour special that aired on Thanksgiving Day in 2006. McCracken thought that a Thanksgiving special would be the perfect time to reveal the creators of some of the friends and show people reuniting. Number 59, there have been a few imaginary friends pitch that didn't make the end show. Most notably, a friend created by a group of college students during a bad drug trip to walk them through the experience. But of course, the writers couldn't find a way to introduce that character in a uh, subtle manner. Number 60, after the drug trip friend fell through, McCracken realized that he didn't even want to imagine what type of friends teenagers would make. This led to a new rule for the Foster's universe. When you hit puberty, you lose the ability to make an imaginary friend. As if puberty wasn't bad enough already. Number 61. However, there are a couple of imaginary friends created by teenagers that exist in the show. They're called Extremosaurs and are locked away in a giant safe in the back of the foster compound. They're all horrifying monsters, which leads Frankie to agree with McCracken, teenagers are no good at making friends, which explains why I spent so many lunches eating by myself in high school. You can't sit with us! Number 62, Foster's also has a large reserve of imaginary friends created by infants. These are called scribbles, and since infants don't have much thought capacity, every scribble looks the same and has very limited capabilities. Number 63, what are the major differences between the writing styles of Foster's and Powerpuff is that Foster's was script-based and Powerpuff was storyboard-based. Since Foster's was more story-driven and it's easier to edit a script than finish a storyboard, McCracken was able to exercise more control over the stores and Fosters. Number 64. Another major difference between Fosters and Powerpuff is that Fosters runs in a 22 minute format, while Powerpuff episodes were 11 minutes each. The longer format allowed more time to deal with business, a uh, McCracken's term for extra time not needed to drive the story where the characters can just be funny. Number 65. When designing Fosters, McCracken and his team wanted to create a more organic feel by giving the characters texture and showing a brush stroke or a loose brush line. This was in direct contrast with the Powerpuff Girls, where McCracken used a style heavily inspired by graphic design that utilized big black lines, just like the one over every Powerpuff Girl's belly. Number 66. There are two major references to the Powerpuff Girls in the pilot alone. In the tag, Blue is slipping through channels and finally appears content when he settles on the Powerpuff Girls. Earlier, when introducing Blue to all the different kinds of friends at Foster's, Wilt calls Mojo Jojo an unimaginative friend and sighs. Some people just copy what they see on TV. What can you do? Number 67. For the theme song, McCracken wanted to blend his love of 60s psychedelic rock with the settling of the Victorian house. He therefore asked composer Jim Venable to create a theme that invokes, quote unquote, psychedelic ragtime. Number 68. The surreal magical sound of the theme song was achieved by using a mix of pianos, a mellotron, and various antique sounds. Oh, and kazoos, of course. Number 69. McCracken had worked with Jim Venable on the Powerpuff Girls. His other credits include Clarence and Samurai Jack. Number 70. The Victorian Mansion was an integral part of McCracken's vision for the show. In his mind, the one visual that represents the show is an ornate Victorian sitting room with couches and weird psychedelic characters sitting on them. He was also intrigued with the endless imaginative and exploratory possibilities a giant Victorian mansion can provide, since it can house any number of mysterious hallways and staircases. Number 71. There's a surprising specific, intricate, and Star Wars based backstory for Jackie Knows that never got onto the show. In 1982, Billy D. Williams found out that he was going to get to pilot the Falcon in Return of the Jedi and realized that he was in need of a co-pilot. So he thought long and hard and in a flash of inspiration he created his own hairy friend, Jackie Knows. The two were a powerful duo and they were set to take on the galaxy, but unfortunately it wasn't to be. George Lucas was tight with this guy called Nyan Num and the rest is history. The letdown caused Jackie to fall into the dark side of Hollywood where he lived a fast, wild, and dangerous life before stumbling into Foster's one day. Number 72. Duchess's full name is Her Royal Duchess Diamond Persnickety, the first, last, and only. Number 73. Duchess's appearance is similar to the infamous cubist paintings of Pablo Picasso. Yet even though Picasso's paintings are now considered to be masterworks, everyone in the show finds her incredibly ugly. Number 74. Duchess is also the only friend who is 2D, just like a painting? 
What? Number 75. Craig the Kraken never had a specific imaginary friend as a child. He said instead he was always talking to nobody and making things up and being creative. I know exactly what he means, but being a kid is probably the only time you can talk to yourself and really get away with it. Isn't that right, Maggie? Yes, that is, Maggie. Good job, Maggie. You're doing a good job recording this. Thanks, Maggie. Number 76. However, McCracken's mother swears he had an imaginary friend named John from Bentleville. McCracken can't remember him at all, so this assumes that if he ever did exist, he probably wasn't a very good friend. Number 77. One popular conspiracy theory going around is that Frankie was actually imagined by Mrs. Foster as a younger version of herself to run the home when she passes away. This could be why, for example, Frankie doesn't have an imaginary friend of her own and why she doesn't pursue an outside career. This isn't at all fact, but conspiracies are fun to entertain. Right, Illuminati? Yeah. Number 78. While we're in a fanciful mood, another theory points to Frankie's driver's license as proof that she is not imaginary, but contends that the real Real Mrs. Foster passed away, and Frankie imagined the current Mrs. Foster because she was so heartbroken. I mean, I guess old ladies aren't that energetic, but it's still a little far-fetched. Number 79. Once Madame Foster got lost in a hallway of Foster's for a week, she had to survive on toothpaste and acorns. But the real question is, why was she traveling around the house with toothpaste and acorns? Number 80. Madame Foster's cookies are a force within themselves. Are these Madame Foster's cookies? They're so special that she only bakes them once a year. Frankly, in particular, has been known to buy over $1,000 worth of cookies. My other question is, what job does Frankie have and are they hiring? Number 81, Blue is allergic to flowers, as if he could be any harder to try to apologize to. Number 82, if you thought that naming the scientists Douglas and Adam was a peculiar choice, it's because there are plenty of references to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in Foster's. In Bust the Two of Us, there is a hitchhiker in sleepwear on the side of the road, holding a sign that says Margarita. Blue also owns a video game whose villain is Lord Beetlebrox. Number 83, Terrence has a stuffed Eduardo doll in his room. Uh, who's making Eduardo dolls? Is Terrence secretly excellent at sewing? Number 84, Eduardo is incredibly rich. He has a vault in Foster's with gold, diamonds, and several bundles of dollars. He's so good with money that he can advise Mr. Harriman with the house's finances. Number 85, Cheese just appeared one morning in Max's room, leading Max to think that he created Cheese on accident. We find out later that Cheese actually belongs to Max's neighbor, Louise. So don't worry guys, crazy imaginary friends can't be created in your sleep. Number 86, even though I love chocolate milk is one of Cheese's famous catchphrases, he's actually lactose intolerant. I pooted. However, Cheese calls all liquids chocolate milk, so it's easy to see why this gets confusing. Number 87. Candy Milo seems to have a hold on some of the most nonsensical characters in Foster's because she voices Cheese as well as Coco. But she does lend her voice to Madame Foster as well, who I guess is kind of a voice of reason. Number 88. Mac has a very dangerous reaction to sugar. He becomes incredibly hyper, thereby breaking his normally calm, cool, and collected manner. Number 89. The episode Race for Your Life, Mac and Blue, is about, surely enough, a 30-mile race between Mac and Blue from the Game Hive Arcade back to Foster's. The show actually prepared two different endings for the episode, one for a Blue victory and one for a Mac victory. Cartoon Network allowed viewers to vote on who would win the race on their website. The Mac ending won out and is featured in reruns, but the Blue ending is out there, somewhere in the universe. Number 90. If you have some kind of weird Mac fetish, he appears naked in three episodes, partying at such a sweet soiree, infernal summer, and I only have surprise for you. We probably shouldn't have told you that. Number 91. Mr. Harriman's self-inflicted schedule is probably much more stricter than you could imagine. His calendar is minute to minute, and he has a pocket watch on him at all times to ensure that he and everyone else stays on schedule. What a wet blanket. Number 92. When Blue finally convinces Mr. Harriman to let loose, Harriman reinvents himself as Harry. Appropriately enough for his muse, Harry wears a Dr. Seuss style hat similar to a hat Blue himself wore in Partying is Such Sweet Sorrow. Number 93. An easier way to get Mr. Harriman to lose his cool is to bring a dog into the room. Harriman is terrified by dogs since quote unquote dogs eat rabbits. What dogs has he been hanging out with? Number 94. Many episode titles in Foster's are music-related puns. I only have surprise for you, plays on 
the Flamingo's hit I Only Have Eyes For You. Squeaker Box refers to Outkast's 2003 album Speaker Box slash The Love Below. Bye Bye Nerdy nods to the musical Bye Bye Birdie, and Ticket to Rod is the Beatles' Ticket to Ride. You get the idea. Number 95. The title puns don't just stop at music. Films are another common theme. Take Room with the Feud, Good Wilt Hunting, The Big Lebowski, and Nightmare on Wilson Way, to name a few. And those aren't really kids' movies either. Number 96. Max voice is provided by Sean Marquette, who got his first role when he was seven years old playing Jamie Martin on the popular soap opera All My Children. His other notable characters, uh, how about Sam from Rocket Power? Totally, dude. Number 97. Max started out looking like a character from Peanuts or Dennis the Menace. McCracken quickly ruled it out because the designs felt dated to him. While doing the second round of drawings, he subconsciously made Mac look more like himself as a child. Number 98. The initial background designs were done by Carol Wyatt, who also designed shows for Rick and Morty and Over the Garden Wall. All of Wyatt's initial backgrounds are done in watercolor and, if you ask me, are absolutely beautiful. Number 99. Before Frankie got her current pleasant demeanor, early sketches showed her to be more like a teenager and therefore perpetually angry. Apparently, perpetually angry also means having darker colored hair. Number 100. Goo is short for Goo Goo Gaga. Goo's parents let her name herself when she was a baby because her parents think it's important to have a good sense of self. Her parents also don't reprimand her much, so she'll have proper self-esteem when she becomes a teenager. But I mean, who are we to call this great or absolutely terrible parenting? Number 101. Goo might actually be the most powerful human in the Foster's universe. Her incredibly powerful imagination gives her a seemingly unlimited capability to invent new friends. This definitely makes her dangerous at a place like Foster's, since she's made around 400 friends. Number 102. Foster's house band is Pizza Party. Well, I guess there's also a taco fiesta, but they're a little underwhelming. Number 103. Even though Blue's one-man band is called the Blue Sabbath Experience Mach 3, his makeup is a reference to the 70s rock band Kiss. His stage entrance also brings to mind plenty of 70s bands, all of whom were brilliantly parodied by Spinal Tap. Number 104. Instead of a musical cue, Goodbye to Blue's title card is just accompanied by the sound of Eduardo crying. We know how you feel, Eduardo. Number 105. McCracken admits that near the show's end, the writers were struggling to keep the show fresh and not repeat themselves. Therefore, Blue and Mac realize that the only thing they haven't done is jump the shark. What kind of fresh water pool doesn't have sharks? Number 106. If you look closely right under where Blue was going to sign Mac's going away card, you can see Craig McCracken's signature. I mean, they really pulled out all the stops and Mac wasn't even going away. What? Number 107. The final shot of the series shows the colors and lines of Foster's slowly disappearing. And this is actually the first shot of the title sequence, but in reverse. Thanks guys so much for watching Tuned Up's 107 Facts. Everything that you need to know about your favorite cartoons. If you liked that, then you'll probably like this video. Or any of the other videos listed below or anywhere on this site. And remember guys, Frederator loves you.